I must first apologize. Um, it can be old husband's tales, it can be young wife's tales, it can be young husband's tales as well. I'm not, I'm not feminist. Um, I think some of you may have uh, mistaken the title. The title say let's share some of our favorite real estate old wife's tales. But I see a lot of questions about what you should do in the next five years and whether prices will go up or prices will go down. So um, I will try to deal with some of these questions along the way. There's a lot of data today. Please enjoy yourself. We are here to be entertained, okay? And if you find anything really ridiculous, please feel free to laugh. Uh, I will start. There's a lot of misconceptions about the residential property market. And the misconceptions have sort of gotten overblown, in particular because we have got a lot of social media and it is easier and easier to broadcast our views now. Um, and the people who are broadcasting views, the people who are shouting the loudest, may not be the people who really get it about the market. They just happen to have the loudest voices. Uh, of course, with POFMA coming in, maybe things will get better, but I really doubt so. POFMA is used for capable people like me. So I posted this when I did a private event with uh, Property Soul, Vina, um, a couple of weeks ago, and I asked on Facebook and some friends then uh, posted what is what they think is a myth in the market. So Singapore got limited land, that's one of the postings. Um, the belief that government is able to keep the land and property price up forever, that's another myth that my friend believed in. And another friend said that LKY said HDB is an asset. We now know what it is. I'm not sure what it is, but I guess he, he means we to be him and his friends. So let's start from the first one. And one of you posted it up just now, that Singapore is land scarce. So Singapore is land scarce means what? Buy property sure make, right? Buy property cannot go wrong. So I published this uh, a few years ago, 2016. So it's been three, three plus years now. Um, None of the people from Akong's office has called me up to tell me that I'm wrong yet. I said that Singapore has enough land at the moment to accommodate 10 million people. So if at that moment, 2016, we already have sufficient land for 10 million people, do you still need to get even more land? Look at the top line. This is Master Plan 1958. 500. 82 square kilometers. Master plan 1980, 618 square kilometers. How many of you PSLE maths got problem? <laughs> 618 square kilometer minus 582 square kilometer is how many square kilometers? Extra. Really PSLE got problem on your maths? <laughs> Then master plan 2003, 693 square kilometers. 1980 to 2003, period of 23 years, and a lot of the yellow parts are still not counted within the 693 yet, but this has been planned. This is now slowly being filled. It is now a lake but the shape of the lake has been changing in the past few years. So 693 square kilometers, then 710 square kilometers in this 2008 master plan. So this is just 11 years ago. Then, five years ago, 719 square kilometers. Draft master plan 2019, but the uh, statistics uh, department from 2018, 723 square kilometers. How much did we grow? Those whose PSLE mathematics got a C, can you answer how much did we grow in the last 60 years from right before independence to now? Save you the trouble. <laughs> Two square kilometers per year for 60 years, a total of 120 square kilometers. That is 21.5 million square feet 
every year for 60 years or a total for those whose PSLE mathematics got an A you would be able to calculate that we have grown by a total of 1.2 billion square feet as a country the plot ratios grow you're not just growing at the surface, right? so when you gain weight and you grow fat is it just the weight and is it just your belly that is growing? your skin surface area also grows so when we grow our skin surface area which is our land mass and then we multiply by a higher and higher plot ratio we can take a lot, a lot of humans okay? so this was from my article from 3 years ago that's why it still says 100 square kilometers now it's 120 square kilometers and there are a lot of new areas that we are building what is the latest hot area? GSW Greater Southern Waterfront right? but two years ago what did you hear was the new area? another three letter word it used to be that four letter words were bad words ABSD TDSR PSLE these are four letter words that we, we think is really rude but these days you get a lot of three letter words as well so before GSW what was the three letter word? you remember JID Jurong Innovation District then during the height of the high speed rail HSR there was the JLD called the Jurong Lake District how many other districts do you not remember if you go and rewind every single national day rally every national day rally actually is like a property agents convention <laughs> because we are going to develop this it will money uh, we will sure make money here Rocho Ophir Beach Road Paya Leba Regional Centre Woodlands Regional Financial Centre North Coast Innovation Corridor Science Park 1, Science Park 2, Changi Business Park Tengah, Bidadari Come on, get along with it Don't just keep your mind on the very last GSW because the PSLE test will test you on the previous year's National Day Rally which is another three letter word NDR they will test you on the previous year's uh, speeches as well we have got so many new areas that we are launching in 10 years time Paya Leba Air Base that's another new four letter word but we will be repeating that in future PLAB which is under planning now in total we can take another 500,000 housing units in Singapore and that can bring our population growth way beyond the 6.9 million if I'm warning you about oversupply that there is too much properties available so prices and rentals may not hold up your first reaction is always if you open the doors they will come in what? when you are old and wrinkled at the high school ball you are sitting in one corner waiting for people to invite you to dance you open up your arms wide wide nobody wants to invite you to dance it is not always it is not a certainty that when you open your doors people will come in what are they coming in for? manufacturing down 8% services down this retail sales down 1.8% this is in the middle of Great Singapore Sale Experience Singapore 2019 Trade down 8.6% Unfortunately, inflation is still up So when you open your doors Why would a foreigner come in? Just because your door is open, people are coming in Must be to steal things, right? <laughs> If you do not have jobs, how would you be able to bring the foreigners in to occupy the properties that you are building? Who are you leasing out to? So, 
fewer job vacancies than unemployed persons now. We have got more persons chasing fewer jobs. Ask the driver the next time you take Grab and Gojek. Have a conversation with them. Find out why they are driving Grab and Gojek. Population grew 1.2% just released last week. Find out which segments of the population actually grew. If it is Singapore citizen population that grew due to the production of extra babies, those babies don't need a home. So where did population growth come from? Student population growth, do we need a lot of housing units to house students? Dormitories, hostels, we need them mainly in employment pass, that's 11%. As pass holders, work permit holders, a fraction of them need housing. If you are an S-Pass holder but working in a certain industry or con work permit holder in certain industries, you are not allowed to rent private residential units or HDB flats. So, work permit holders, many of them are staying in workers' dormitories. Then, this category of foreigners called FDW, they by law have to stay with us. So again, no housing needs required. Then 17% dependence of citizens, dependence of PRs and dependence on work pass holders. Dependent pass holders, since you are a dependent on somebody else, if that person already has housing, the dependent stays with that person. So where is our population growth coming from that is making you so enthusiastic that when you open doors, people will come and they will fill up your apartments. 5.7 million new number due to more foreign workers and the foreign workers are in the construction sector and in the services sector do these people spend two thousand dollars to rent a shoebox apartment from you so this is an extremely busy chart and the number for year 2019 for public housing, this is just my own estimate, but the rest of the numbers are referenceable to the government. Various departments, uh, DOS, URA, HDB, and my company. Our population growth this year is 33,000 non-residents and 31.9 thousand Singaporeans plus PRs. Out of the 31,900 Singaporeans plus PRs, about 22,000 are babies. So, no need extra housing unit, right? Unless you're going to make your baby grow up early by asking your baby to live outside first on his own in a shoebox, not in a shoebox apartment. So, the other 33,000, if they are mainly work permit holders in construction and services sectors, just reflect on how many units of housing they would need. And in the past two years, it was a negative 27,000 and a negative 2.1 thousand. So, back to my question. This myth that if we open our doors wide wide, people will come in. My question to you is, where are the jobs? Without the jobs, they won't come in. And with manufacturing down 8%, trade down 8.6%, and you should look at the, since Donald Trump and China started fighting, what these negative numbers look like in the past few months, you will see next few months, not, not going to be uh, open the door, anybody will come in, okay? What's the next one? Ah, I wanted to uh, sidetrack a little bit before I move on to the next myth. Office at 11.5% vacancy is a recession level vacancy. The last two re recessions, we were at around 12%. Today, office is at 11.5%. In the last two weeks, what was the news about one of the largest office Office tenants in Singapore. Correct. It's a company called We. Eight locations in Singapore. When they disappear, it might, it will definitely bring this across the 12% mark. We are not having a recession yet, but our 10 million vacant square feet, which is equivalent to 10 vivo cities that are Kang Kang. Yet there are many bullish analysts out there saying office will do well. And 
this is simply a reflection of not enough jobs. If we are hiring steadily, offices wouldn't be that vacant. Then, retail, well, we know retail has got a lot of vacancies. Industrial, 56 million square feet of vacant industrial space, completed vacant factories, uh, business parks, warehouses that are vacant. And with the trade numbers and the import-export numbers dropping, would this number be any better? Factory space is at all-time high vacancy as well. 56 million square feet. Can you imagine 56 vivo cities that are distributed around Singapore and the entire vivo city is vacant? That's what it means. Okay? Let's move on to myth number three. Real estate is a hedge against inflation war. <laughs> Firstly, you must believe that inflation is the boogeyman. Is inflation such a big threat that we need to hedge against it? If Mr. Brown were here, he would be making lots of faces about inflation. Oh. But it's not. What contributes to inflation? This is the broad number. Inflation has many items, but these are broad categories. You look through these categories and you think for yourself, in the next 20 years, which category will contribute to inflation? Food, clothing and footwear. Will clothing and footwear contribute to inflation? $300 limited edition Adidas shoes don't count in the inflation basket, right? Housing and utilities, will that contribute to inflation? Okay, this one question mark still. Later, I'll show you some other numbers. Will healthcare contribute to inflation? Healthcare will contribute like crazy unless we construct hospitals, polyclinics, clinics, old age care facilities like there's no tomorrow. But in Master Plan 2019, cannot smell. Okay, then communication, likely to be not really going to be uh, contributing much to inflation. Recreation and culture? Maybe not. Education? Probably. So if you really want to hedge inflation, if you really think that inflation is such a scary thing in your life, open the cupboard, it's dark at night and inflation pops out at you, you're scared by it, then invest in healthcare, invest in education. Would investing in residential properties really make sense? <clears throat> inflation in the blue line, MAS core inflation, HDB resale index. This type of trajectory in the last 30 years when our economy is growing, when the economy is growing together and population growth is strong, the trajectory goes along the same path and you claim that real estate hedges inflation. What if I say that inflation hedges real estate? They happen to be growing on the same path. So, in the year around the year 2002, uh, Professor Sing Tian Fu, who is now the head of the Institute of Real Estate Studies in NUS, published a paper looking at whether there's inflation hedging capabilities of property versus non-property investments. His conclusion: industrial property fares very well. Who is invested in industrial property? you would have hedged inflation well based on the period of time that he is investigating. Secondly, industrial property and shop houses, his conclusion, can hedge. What about residential? Residential property is found to be a good hedge during low inflation periods. Residential property is a good hedge during low inflation, meaning during low inflation, when inflation is 1% a year, residential properties go up 1% a year and they are aligned. But during a period of low inflation, why are you afraid of inflation? And then, strangely, some other professors from overseas, they are supportive of the hypothesis that property returns move one-to-one -one correspondence to inflation rates. What does that sentence mean? It moves one to one in correspondence to inflation rates. Every morning, we all brush teeth. And our teeth brushing makes the sun rise. It corresponds one to one. 
Every morning, all of us are brushing teeth, right? A few of you dirty ones don't have teeth here, okay? Don't let your friends know. But how can you say that just because it is one to one, that by investing in one, you are hedging yourself against the other? So all of our teeth brushing really made the sun rise, is it? Correlation and causation are two separate things. They happen to move in tandem with each other. Now you think forward then. Will real estate, will residential real estate really hedge inflation? If inflation is mainly going to come from healthcare costs, education costs, and in the next 20 years, our very large bulk of baby boomers who are now growing older by the day, and you see that as they approach 75 to 80 years old, we are losing them very quickly in numbers. These people will be, firstly, these people are 90% homeowners. And when they grow older and they start to pass away, 90% of them have a home to sell. And when these people are passing away and selling their homes, or their children are selling their homes to them, in the next 10 to 15 years, it is this bottom bunch of people who are going to be buyers. How many buyers do you have versus how many sellers are in the market? So, what is the opportunity for real estate to be inflating in the next 20 years? unless you really create massive number of jobs to bring in massive number of foreign workers. Otherwise, this is tough.